I think there are a lot of really important points in this case that are, are fairly reflective of what we tend to see uh, in women who present with ovarian cancer. So for example, this patient presented with new onset early satiety, abdominal bloating, and discomfort. And that is what we tend to see as a constellation of symptoms in patients with advanced ovarian cancer. As you know, they, they typically present with advanced disease at the time of diagnosis. And her age as well at 59 in a postmenopausal setting is very typical for epithelial ovarian cancers. The physical examination is often, uh, pres patients often present with abdominal distension, with left lower quadrant tenderness or uh, diffuse tenderness. In this patient, she did have left lower quadrant tenderness and shifting dullness on percussion. And that really is very typical of what we do tend to see. I think it's important to point out that a pelvic examination is very important for the generalist uh, or the family practice doctor, the internist, whoever sees patients who uh, fit this description. It's a really important component of the workup. Other things that are uh, necessary in the clinical workup or uh, notable, I would say, are the transvaginal ultrasound. And that is the imaging of choice for women in whom you really want to look and see what the adnexae look like. Um, in this patient, as with most with ovarian cancer, this patient had a, an ovarian mass that was identified. Now we don't usually recommend a CT, MRI, or PET CT scan as uh, the first option for screening these patients, but certainly the appropriate workup includes a chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT as this patient had to really define the extent of the disease. This patient, it looks like, had extension to the liver capsule without parenchymal involvement. She also appears to have had retroperitoneal lymph node involvement and some ascites, so we can see that she really did have extensive ovarian cancer. Um, one of the things that we look at as well is to see if there's a pleural effusion, and fortunately for this patient, she did not appear to have a pleural effusion or parenchymal disease, so not stage four. That, that's good news. Um, this patient had a high-grade epithelial ovarian cancer, and that, of course, is the most common type of ovarian cancer that we see. It looks like uh, likely a high-grade serous uh, carcinoma. Um, some of the details, you know, we do uh, recommend obtaining a CA125 level, uh, and hers is elevated, 385 units per ml. And again, that is very typical for what we see with women with epithelial ovarian cancers. Um, also important in determining how we manage these patients uh, are, is her performance status. And fortunately for her, her performance status is one. That can play into any decision that we make with regard to neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus upfront surgery. Something that's uh, very important in today's testing is that once we have diagnosis of ovarian cancer, we really want to know about uh, germline genetic testing, as well as uh, molecular testing uh, of somatic mutations. And so uh, this patient had a germline, uh, germline genetic testing that showed that she was HRD negative and BRCA1 and 2 wild type. And I, we'll get into that a little bit later of why that's so important. Okay, so this patient had uh, a specific treatment involving an abdominal approach to a total hysterectomy bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy and uh, lymph node dissection with optimal debulking. Uh, she was able to get down to an R0 uh, resection status, which of course means that there's no visible tumor remaining. And that's really the goal for any patient uh, with, with surgery. Now, um, this patient did have retroperitoneal lymph node involvement. We wouldn't necessarily do a lymph node dissection with every patient with bulky disease in the abdomen, but of course, this patient had enlarged nodes, and so that is the justification for her uh, lymph node dissection. Uh, she received IP, IV, paclitaxel, and carboplatin with bevacizumab every three weeks for six cycles, uh, followed by bevacizumab for six more cycles, and um, obtained a complete response, as uh, the majority of patients do. Uh, her post-treatment CA125, though not quite normal, uh, was down to 48. I think that that brings into uh, the conversation whether we should incorporate intraperitoneal chemotherapy 
in every patient, um, and if we should incorporate bevacizumab into the treatment of every patient. Uh, certainly, we have uh, we have some information with regard to the use of intraperitoneal therapy. Uh, we, in fact, have three uh, trials that suggest that there's an improvement uh, in outcome compared to IV paclitaxel and carboplatin alone. But we know that that benefit sometimes can be overcome by the use of bevacizumab. So here, the use of IV, IP, paclitaxel, carboplatin plus bevacizumab with bevacizumab to follow um, is a little bit different uh, from sort of the standard approach that many would use uh, in the current, uh, current treatment strategy. Uh, when we look at follow-up, uh, this patient had uh, follow-ups every three months with a CA125 level, and that is incorporated into our routine management of, uh, of surveillance because we want to be able to identify uh, a trend of rising CA125 that would prompt us to be able to detect an early recurrence. Uh, this patient had uh, no gross pelvic masses or nodes on her follow-up, a normal exam, and a normal performance status. So that's great news for her.